John and I know the Church of St. Vincent quite well. We joined right after we were married in 1965, and we're proud to say we've attended Mass every Wednesday and Sunday since. What state is the church in now? Well, it's a shame what happened, what that man did to our church. What do you mean? Well, it's really none of our business, so, so I, I don't want to get into it too much. Uh, but the church has not recovered since Father Stibe had his... Uh, he made a mockery out of the church. Who is Paul Stibe? He was a priest. Wasn't he a priest? He was a priest? He was a priest, man. But he got kicked out. Why? Man, if you knocked up a lady, they'd kick you out too. I was born November 10th, 1968 to James and Sarah Stive in Millsburg, Ohio. My parents named me after the Apostle Paul, who experienced Christ on the road to Damascus. On December 14th, 1976, I participated in my first communion at the Church of St. Boniface. Twelve years later, I graduated from St. John's Seminary and took my position at St. Vincent de Paul shortly after. I served there almost 20 years until I was asked to leave 13 months ago. I have a child and I'm also unemployed. Are you looking for a job? No, not currently. I rather like what I'm doing right now. Now, you were never formally excommunicated because the church wanted to leave you the possibility of a reconciliation, right? Yes, that's correct. But since you left, you've made no attempts to come back to the church or to establish communication with your former congregants. Right. Father Stark, people are beginning to Alex, think that... please. It's just Paul now. Paul, the people at St. Vincent's think that you've abandoned them and their faith. Well, I suppose I have in a lot of ways. Well, don't you feel at least a semblance of remorse? No, I don't. Do you have any intentions of making amends with the people or the church that you scandalized? I believe that being forced out of the church was probably the best thing that could have happened to me, and in many ways the best thing I could have done for you. He was a good man, I think, uh, despite his flaws. He was compassionate and sincere, and it was clear that he listened with an open heart when others spoke to him. But that was also his problem, I suppose. He never seemed very comfortable talking. He also gravitated towards the more troubled folks at the church. Yes, uh, the lady that he, she had a troubled life. Who is Paul? First time I, m I met him a few months ago, he used to come every other night over here. He didn't buy anything. He just come hang around here or outside. He talked to the people they come by. What does he talk to them about? Whatever they want. Sometimes things they don't want to talk about. I seen one woman try and scratch him up like a cat, and I seen him with a black eye more than once, but that just means they don't like this question. It opens a door they don't want to open. About a month ago, I spent five hours listening to a woman telling me about her marriage. It's amazing. She simply told me her story. She didn't hold anything back. All of the sordid bits must have been great. I don't take pleasure listening to how hard people's lives are. Well, I'm not really sure what else you can get out of it. You barely know them. I'd say I probably knew that woman better than I knew most of the people at St. Vincent's. Wait. You're actually saying you knew that woman better after five hours than you did say, the Stanleys after 18 years? Yes. That's ridiculous. No, it's not. 
Everything people said or did at St. Vincent's was focused through the lens of the church. It was the common referent, the main conversation piece. How can you learn about someone when the only thing they want to talk about is something other than himself? What about the confessional? That must have satisfied you. With very few exceptions, it was the same. People simply told me what they thought I wanted to hear. I gave them a few meaningless words to say and they'd go. You can't build intimacy with someone with a wall between you and them. Did we record the conversation with Paul? No. No, sir. No. And I don't want a camera there for that. Why not? Well, I don't know what you're looking to get out of it. For all I know, you're looking for something that isn't there. I asked several people if I could record their conversations with you, but they all said no. Well, what did you expect them to say? Well, I thought they'd say it was okay, but without hearing them, how do you expect anyone who sees this film to believe that what you're doing is worthwhile? Why don't we talk? We have been talking. No, we haven't. I've sat here answering your questions, but we haven't talked. So why don't we? You mean, put myself on camera? Yes. I can't do that. Why not? Well, I'm directing, and this is a film about you. Is it? I can't put myself in the film. Aren't you already? Wait a second, I don't know that Listen this to me. It'll be okay. Turn the camera around. It'll be fine. All right. Can we talk about your first confession? I was young, and I didn't know any better. I thought I was just supposed to come in and tell you everything. I appreciated that. You were one of the few people to be so candid with me. Now, can you remember why you were so upset? I hit my brother and I felt guilty about it. And I didn't know how to tell my parents. And how did you feel when you left? Much better. Have you been to confession since I left? No, I haven't. So what do you say, Alex? Are you ready to turn off the camera? 